of the rings. Corey! What are you doing? Come on. Welcome back to Rings and Realms! We're excited to explore more of Middle-earth this week, this time heading into Khazad-dûm and Rune and returning to the familiar sights of Eregion and Linden. As always, we could not be here without the support of our Kickstarter crew who helped our campaign be successful. It's been really brilliant having your questions, your observations, and joining us in our behind-the-scenes Discord community. If you'd like to join, you can still pledge at Rings and Realms on Kickstarter. And your pledge can give you access to our exclusive Discord, it could give you a guest spot on the show, or you could even join the backstage production team as a producer. We're in our second installment of this epic three-episode drop. Yeah, we cannot wait to get started, though. We're really excited that, Corey, I kind of think we should open that first age bottle. What a great idea. Yeah, let's do it. We deserve it after right? this huge week of three episodes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, my bad. Uh, oh. oh, my God. I, I guess we'll just have some tea. Let's um, start the show. In the opening shots of Khazad Doom, we see the magnificent East Gate, the one which most of the Company of the Ring will someday emerge from after meeting the Balrog. We are treated to a view of the beautiful and complex mirror and crystal array through which the sunlight is brought into the mountain. These shots not only show off the grandeur of Khazad Doom and the excellence of dwarf engineering, but they also show the dwarves' connection to the outside world. Casa Doom is not a dark and closed off inner world. It's a thriving realm full of light and growth and beauty. But those beams of light turn out to be a lifeline. When the earthquakes collapse the light shafts, that lifeline is cut and the dwarves start to sink into the darkness. This disaster is particularly important if we remember the name of this place. It is still called Casa Doom, but we know the future and the elves will someday name this place Moria after its fall. In episode two, Casa Doom has already, at least for now, become the Black Pit. Episode two begins with some map action, black tendrils reaching out from Mount Doom across Rovanian towards Casa Doom. What we actually see in Casa Doom are the earthquakes. Narvi provides a purely naturalistic explanation for all this. The eruption of the mountain, which caused the remote earthshakes. He links it to Mount Doom, but he gives no hint that there may be anything sinister involved. The stone singers should be able to fix a problem like this, finding the best places to dig in order to repair the light shafts or build new ones. In Deesa's words, the stone singers will find the light. But we have already heard that the situation might not be this simple. The other two stone singers whisper about a curse on the mountain, linking that curse to Durin's letting that elf into the mountain. 
In this interpretation, the shutting off of the lights and the connection to the outside world is a kind of protest by the mountain itself, something like an antibody reaction against the elvish foreign body that has intruded inside it. Disa asserts her confidence that they will be able to reach the mountain as usual, dismissing their superstitious interpretation as mere speculation. She says that they, through their song, will be able to prove that there has been no break in their relationship with the mountain. Disa is wrong. Their song, which continually rises with an ever-increasing disharmony tinged even with desperation, does harm rather than good. So firm is the mountain in its rejection of their song that the final glimmers of light are sealed off. As King Durin says, the bond between the dwarves and the mountain is broken. Disa confirms this to Prince Durin later. They can't hear the mountains anymore. Ironically, the advanced warning that she receives of the earthquake while in the marketplace is the last thing she ever hears from the mountain. They have been cut off, not just from the outside world, but from the mountain itself. So what's really going on here? We've been given three interpretations. Narvi's naturalistic explanation has been disproven. This can be no normal geological phenomenon, since the dwarves' relationship with the mountain has been changed. Some larger metaphysical cause could be at work. Is it internal to the mountain itself? A reaction against the things done by the Durans? The dwarves believe that the mountain is alive in some sense, and that they have a relationship with it. And that relationship certainly could, in theory, be compromised. Remember that Prince Durin accused his father of profaning the crown he wears at the end of season one. But King Durin doesn't think this way. His own diagnosis is that the hand of darkness has closed around Khazad Dum. That image suggests not an internal corruption or reaction, but a power from outside pressing in against them. He seems to imply that the dwarves are not at fault, but under siege. And if we remember the black tendrils on the map reaching out from Mordor towards khazad we might be inclined to agree with him. Those tendrils look not like indicators of tectonic activity, but like the creeping worm-like evil of Sauron that we have already seen in his reshaping, and perhaps also on the Tree of Linden. khazad may indeed be shrouded not just in darkness, but in the shadow. Now, at the same time that we are watching the crisis of khazad Doom becoming Moria before our eyes, we are also continually reminded of the more personal drama, the conflict between the two Durins, and its consequences on Durin and Disa. From the beginning of the episode, we are invited to see these two plot lines in parallel, one big and one small, but the two of them reflecting each other. Durin and Disa start out in the market, struggling under new limitations on food. Soon, the dwarves of khazad Doom are under the threat of starvation as their crops wither. The smaller story reflects and anticipates the larger story. This same pattern is noticeable with the standoff between the Durins. Disa compares the hearts of her husband and her king to a root-bound parsnip, a food plant choked by its own constricted growth and thus not producing food. Their own emotional conflict is mapped onto the starvation problem in Moria. Even more evocatively, she says that King Durin's heart is so tightly bound it can scarcely beat. The heart of the king is constricted by his own anger and pride, and it is choking off his life. The king's own image of the hand of darkness that has closed around the dwarf kingdom reflects this accusation on the larger scale. The parallel suggests that the conflict between the Durins is at least like the shadow that is choking the life of khazad Doom. Episode 2 suggests that the relationship between the Durins is not only an important personal matter, but that it's tied to the larger drama of khazad Doom. So, starting in on this scene, we're reminded of the Dwarven Kingdom and how they function and grow their food, through their intricate light and mirror system, to strong, bold, Dwarven music. The music lifts, and the buzz of the crowd takes us into a market of produce with Durin and Diza. I wanted to talk about them as a couple for a moment, and the importance of this scene. They have a great partnership. They're given a lot of screen time together, and I recently saw a work by James Tauber of the Digital Tolkien Project. He did some analysis on their screen time and the spoken word of the dwarves in the series, and Disa is second only to Durin. But Disa only has six scenes to Durin's 17, and she has 705 words 
to Durin's 1,371. It's almost half, well, more than. This isn't a hard and fast C moment, but it does show the importance of Disa, her influence and her partnership with Durin, and the import given to her scenes. Things happen because of her, through her, and around her. The scene in the market is a great example of this. They're shopping together, they're equal, they're sharing tasks and responsibilities, they're discussing money and family as a couple would. The market is windy, it's well lit, it's bustling, and they're an easy fo focal point in this melee still. They are next to and around each other this entire scene. They're facing each other and they're doing a bit of a dance of movement, but always together. He's following her, they're in conversation, but they're focused on each other too. Then there's a break in their shared movement, kind of like a break in their relationship to the mountain perhaps that Corey mentioned before. Durin turns away and actually walks away from her, creating a rift between them. Disa stops, the sound goes fuzzy, and she moves independently, hearing the mountain, for what we'll soon learn is the last time while he carries on walking. This is paralleled then by the actual rift of the mountain. He then throws himself on top of her, perhaps trying to repair that rift, and then we see the destruction of Khazad Doom. Pillars and bridges collapsing, tunnels giving away, the rift is over, the action and the collapse is over for them, but not for cause of doom. Most importantly, and visu visually significantly, the lights go out. So this closes off cause of doom, bringing the hand of darkness around it and leaving it in the dark. Literally and figuratively, it's a fade to black without resolve for the dwarves or for the audience. The exact powers of the Three Rings are not clearly understood, even by the wielders, as Círdan himself notes. One power that they clearly have, however, is the power to bring their wearers visions. When we first see Galadriel in Episode 2, she is having a vision, though that fact is not obvious at first. She is planting seeds, as elves do before battle, we were told in Season 1. This context prompts us to see her as preparing herself for the coming conflict with Sauron. It also shows us her motivations to bring healing and blessing to the lands of Middle-earth. But the seeds she plants sprout into the insidious vines which bind and then kill poor Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor, meanwhile, had been speaking the ring verse, speaking not only of the three, but also of the seven and the nine. This is very well done, I think. This shows that it's a glimpse of the future, since those rings are not yet made or even imagined by Celebrimbor. The fact that Celebrimbor is speaking of these things in the Black Speech, however, is eloquent and chilling evidence of the twisting of Celebrimbor's intentions by Sauron. Celebrimbor is speaking of his own creations, but he is doing so in the language that Sauron invented. Moreover, this is the first time that a character inside the show ever hears the ring verse. In the books, we are not told who wrote the famous poem. Sauron spoke the last lines and wrote them on the One Ring, but the first lines, the ones that Celebrimbor speaks in Galadriel's vision, are just said to be lines long known in elven lore. The show has made the chilling suggestion that this vision is the actual origin of that verse. The Ring verse has not here been translated into black speech, it's the other way around. The verse that many of us have been able to recite since we were kids turns out to have been translated from the Black Speech. Seriously creepy. Anyway, notice what Nenya, Galadriel's ring, seems to be doing through this vision. Galadriel is being given insight into what is going to happen far away and in the future. She is also being given some insight into her own heart and actions. The fact that Sauron's twining roots of death come from seeds she planted with good intentions is a warning. It reflects both her own guilt for the past and a warning for her future. It turns out, of course, that Galadriel isn't the only one having visions. Gilgalad has seen mountains crumbling and black clouds closing over white towers. Both of these things will happen in this very episode. The mountains of Khazad-dûm are indeed crumbling in a very inconvenient way, even as Gilgalad is having these visions, and we will see the black clouds close over the great tower forge of Eregion later in this episode. 
by the way, I love how the description of black clouds over white towers could also be a glimpse from afar of the dawnless day and the assault of Mordor on Gondor in The Lord of the Rings. Perhaps in these visions of the unseen world, Gilgalad is seeing both current events and the later events of a future age which echo them. It's interesting that Galadriel's terrible vision of Celebrimbor's corruption and death comes to her in the middle of a council of war in which the elves are planning how to attack Sauron in Mordor. Galadriel believes that the vision is telling her of their real danger from Sauron. He is going to need not armies, but rings. Eregion is in danger, not from assault, she believes, but from infiltration. Gilgalad believes that Galadriel herself is the one vulnerable to infiltration. He speaks of how she has let Sauron into her mind. Gilgalad's observation seems confirmed by Galadriel's brief and uncomfortable memory of sitting on that log with Halbrand after the battle with the orcs in season one. In that scene, Halbrand spoke of a feeling he shared with Galadriel while they had been fighting together, and she admits that she felt it too. Gilgalad asserts that once Sauron establishes that kind of connection, his victim will be unable to keep him out. Gilgalad seems to speak of a real mental connection, rather like the telepathic link between two people that Tolkien describes in some places. According to Gilgalad, once a person willingly opens her heart and mind to Sauron, he can now re-enter whenever he wants, like a vampire being invited into a house. Celebrimbor may be at risk from Sauron, but Galadriel would be at greater risk. Galadriel does not reject Gilgalad's claim, and she even tells Elrond she agrees with it. Galadriel's emotional struggles with her memories of Sauron serve as a kind of commentary on that part of her vision, of the seeds and sprouting evil roots. She is terrified that her every attempt to oppose Sauron now could play right into his plans and bring about the evil she would oppose. Elrond, of course, is much harsher about this. When she says that she cannot let Sauron back in, he tells her that he never left. When she says she needs his help to get through Sauron's labyrinth, he points out with exasperation that if it is Sauron's labyrinth, maybe she should try not going into it for once. Elrond is pretty salty, but as usual, he's not wrong. Galadriel's ring seems to be sending her warnings about getting enmeshed in Sauron's schemes, but these visions are also driving her back into them. It's easy to see why Elrond is alarmed. Gilgalad is also showing some intriguing signs that his heart is being turned by the ring. When Galadriel says that Sauron needs rings to conquer, Gilgalad impulsively covers Vilya with his other hand, as if to protect or hide it. The gesture has just the faintest whiff of, you'll never take my precious from me, about it. And notice anything else about that shot? Gilgalad is not wearing any other rings. When he puts Vilya on for the first time, he is putting it on his only free finger, and Vilya is smaller and more subtle than any of the other rings which he is already wearing, and that is saying something. But we can now see that Gilgalad has suddenly become a one-ring high king. That could be a mere fashion choice, or it could be the beginning of an obsession. Back to Elrond, however. Elrond's concerns about the elves' choice to use the three are almost entirely valid. As I said in the last episode, Elrond's fear that the three have been corrupted directly by Sauron are not true. That does not mean that his analysis of the situation is incorrect. Elrond knows that the very idea of the rings was influenced by Sauron, even if he didn't touch these three rings himself. Elrond has profound doubts of the motivations of anyone who would take up a ring. In doing so, they are collaborating with Sauron because they are showing that they are willing to do what he does. Their ends may be different from Sauron's, but the means are the same. This is definitely uncomfortable. And although Elrond is being rather a jerk to Galadriel, his resistance to the idea of the rings at this point reflects a legitimate suspicion of the three that is quite visible in Tolkien's stories as well. The turning point for Elrond comes in the conversation he has with Círdan. Círdan's demonstration with the fish of the power of the ring is rather chilling. The rings have an inherent power to draw and command the wills of living creatures, apparently, even to their own destruction, as we can see by the one fish that flops out of the water in pursuit of the ring. 
Seeing Kierden's hand underwater and thinking of the draw of the ring might make us uncomfortably remember Diagol, drawn to the bottom of the river, to the glittering ring in the mud, and to his own destruction. Kierden is fully aware that the power of the rings in Sauron's hands would be tremendous, and that he could use that power to dominate the wills of living things. He has no illusions about not only the strength, but the kind of power that the rings have. Kierden even insists that Elrond is right to fear the kind of power that the rings give. Its potential for evil is very great, and its potential to turn the hearts of good people who intend to use that power to achieve good ends is also great. Kierden, however, clearly thinks it's worth the risk. Kierden does believe that it matters what motivates you to use the rings, and we have to admit that he seems to be the most untroubled by the use of his ring. Instead of foretelling doom, Elrond should be glad that the ones using the rings are in fact the greatest and the best intentioned of the elves, he says. Kierden has some issues, but he manages to turn Elrond's suspicions around in a really important way. I don't think Kierden is right about the rings. His speech about judging the art instead of the artist implies that the artworks, the rings, are in themselves totally unproblematic. They could be misused, sure, but they are beautiful and flawless in themselves. In episode one, he said that they are the only example of perfection this side of Valinor. Perfection is a pretty strong word. This is an observation that should certainly make us suspicious, I think. Kierden also sounds like he will soon be calling the ring his precious. Kierden's own strong bias in favor of the rings aside, however, his point about humility is important. Kierden points out that Elrond has gone beyond warning his king and his friends about the rings. He has escalated from distrusting the rings to condemning the ring bearers. Elrond may not be wrong about the rings, but he is wrong about his friends who wield them. He is wrong to let his doubts and his well-founded concerns turn him against his friends. Elrond's final decision to lead Galadriel's company reflects his change of heart, not about the rings, but about Galadriel herself. The fact that she is in danger and in need of his help turns out to be a poor reason to refuse to help her. Tolkien readers, of course, know that Elrond will himself someday be wearing Gilgalad's blue ring, Vilya. Elrond has a long road ahead of him still, and it will be interesting to watch his further development as he walks down that road. Episode 2 gives us a look into the center of the dark power in the east. We see what looks like a temple, but is called Karas Gair, which translates to something like Fortress of Terror. That's a pretty good name for an evil lair, I have to say. Here we see ritual magic being performed. The moths released from their jars should remind us of the scene in Season 1 when the fireflies were released from the Harfoot lamp so that the stranger could use his magic on them. The magic of the stranger took its toll on the fireflies, sapping their little insect lives and killing them all. In the Fortress of Terror, it is more explicit that the power of life is used as fuel for magic. The blood ritually shed by the chosen acolyte gives power to the spell. The woman herself is not a volunteer. She looks a little surprised, as if she did not expect to be chosen for this particular role in the ritual, though she submits to it. The stranger was very remorseful over the deaths of the fireflies. The bad blue wizard smiles with dark pleasure at the blood magic which drains the life from his acolyte. The dark wizard uses his staff to execute the spell that transports his servant to him. Notice that what we are seeing is essentially the power over the unseen world. In watching the acolyte take gradual shape, we appear to be seeing a dramatic crossing of the boundary between the seen and the unseen world. We have now been witness to the unseen world coming into play everywhere that magic happens in the show with Sauron, with Galadriel and Gilgalad and their use of the Three Rings, and now again with the wizards in the East. The wizard's actual use of the word acolyte to describe his servant makes explicit what has already been fairly apparent. The Dark Wizard is the leader of a magic cult in the East. This, of course, is just what one might have expected from one of the Blue Wizards. Blue Wizard involvement in the establishment of magic cults in the East was one of the only things Tolkien ever wrote about the Blue Wizards. 
The Dark Wizard is clearly the other Blue Wizard. He is an Istar, like the Stranger, but he has decided to use his magic to establish his own power, sitting on a rough throne in what looks like an ancient temple of stone. Nori, meanwhile, is busily doing what most of the internet has been doing for a while now, trying to figure out the Stranger's name. She makes some very hobbity suggestions, but the stranger explains that none of them are his name. He is obviously not fat enough for the name Fredegar, for instance. Our friend the Blue Wizard explains that a name can't be randomly chosen. It has to already be felt to fit when it is revealed. <laughs> we'll see about that. The main storyline, however, focuses on the wizard's control of his power. He seems to be able to use the power at will, but has a hard time controlling the power he unleashes. He appears to need a staff for this. The staff is, apparently, to be a focus for his power. But sticks, like names, can't just be chosen at random. Just as he will only accept the right name, he can only use the right gand. The stick that he finds by the well had definitely appeared in his dream in episode one, but it turns out not to be the right stick. The magic wind that he had conjured with the found stick flies out of his control, and he reaps the whirlwind instead. The heart of the stranger's story in season two so far is focused on a central tension between his love for his Harfoot friends and the danger of his power. In season one, he wasn't sure whether he was a friend or a peril to the Harfoots. In season two, he's still not sure. His intentions are clear, but his every attempt to do good puts his friends at risk. In attempting to save Nori and Poppy's lives, he ends up sweeping them away. Now, we can see a clear pattern in the Rune storyline so far. When something seemingly bad happens, it leads to an unexpected good result. A failed growth spell in a blown up tree turns out to reveal a bountiful supply of edible bugs. When the hunters force them to leave their trail and set out across the desert, they find the well. I am reasonably confident for this reason, that Nori and Poppy are not only going to survive their tornado experience, but it's probably going to take them somewhere beneficial that they would never otherwise have gotten to. The pattern that the story is following is the pattern of The Hobbit, in which Bilbo and his companions are constantly diverted from their planned course by one disaster after another. But it turns out that in the end, those diversions continually directed them to the one safe path to their destination. After all, we do hear in The Hobbit that Gandalf the wizard lured hobbit lads and lasses off into the blue. Perhaps the stranger is just taking that model a little too literally. Now, one final note on the Easterlings. Remember that I said in episode one that the distorted spyglass and the masked face of the Easterling spy suggested something twisted and inhuman, as if that person was part of an unnatural blight. In episode two, the hunter comes before the dark wizard and asks him to heal the curse upon the flesh of his people. It sounds like there is, in fact, some kind of blight on their people. Know what this makes me wonder? If the healing of the tree can be accomplished by the Three Rings, and the breaking of the darkness of khazad Doom can be accomplished by the Seven, could the lifting of the curse on the Easterlings be brought about with the power of one or more of the Nine? Maybe we're going to see one of the Nine given to the Dark Wizard himself, and he will use it to heal the Easterlings and thus solidify his power over them. Could the Bad Blue Wizard, in fact, become the Witch King? A, a ring wraith of dark sorcery who was, in Tolkien's original conception, in fact, a wizard gone bad? We've seen lots of good Nazgul candidates in the show so far, but none have had anything even vaguely like the prerequisite dark sorcery to become the Witch King. I think maybe we now have an excellent candidate for that position. In episode eight of season one, we saw the making of the three. We next see them en route to Linden at the beginning of season two. It's clear that Celebrimbor sent them to Gilgalad, and this shows us two things. First, it shows as we've seen before that Gilgalad has a high level of authority. In the Silmarillion, the Noldor elves rule many realms in Beleriand, and they are kings in those realms. There is a high king, however, who holds authority over the other kings. He doesn't rule them as a monarch, though. He is closer to a leader among equals, having a sort of moral and strategic authority. The other elves rule their own realms with almost complete autonomy. 
In the show, Gilgalad rules much more absolutely over all the elves in Middle-earth, from Linden through Eregion and on even to the frontiers, as we saw in Arondir's company in season one. Celebrimbor's decision to send the rings to Gilgalad shows his submission to the authority of the king. Secondly, Celebrimbor's sending of the rings is an important statement of his own humility. Celebrimbor is the grandson of Feanor, and that connection is heavily emphasized. The three rings are the crowning achievement of Celebrimbor's life work and directly parallel the three gems of Feanor, the Silmarils. When Feanor made the Silmarils, he kept them for himself, and he quickly began to grudge even the sight of them to others. Celebrimbor's release of the three is a big deal. He has done what his grandfather could never do. But there's more. The Feanor connection shows how these two elements of Celebrimbor's humility come together. When the two trees of light in Valinor were destroyed, there was a chance they could have been restored. If Feanor had given the Silmarils to the Valar, the light from the Silmarils could have healed the trees and restored the glory of Valinor. But Feanor refused because he couldn't bear to lose the Silmarils, and so the trees were not restored and he instead soon led the Noldor in a rebellion against the authority of the Valar. By sending the rings to Linden, Celebrimbor has entirely reversed the choice of Feanor. He has given up his crowning achievements, the Three Rings, sending them away and not keeping them and their power for himself. He has done this in submission to authority, giving the glory of the usage of the rings to the High King Gilgalad and to whomever Gilgalad might choose. Celebrimbor has let the rings go, and the direct result of his choice is that the tree is restored to health, and indeed it is glorified, becoming radiant like Laurelin herself, the tree of gold in Valinor. Celebrimbor has completely reversed the choice of Feanor. Now, let's look at Sauron's approach to manipulating Celebrimbor. Sauron comes to Eregion in an attitude of humility. He's dirty, he's ragged, he's wounded. He plays on Celebrimbor's assistant, Merdania's compassion and even pity. Their generosity provides the first crack in the door. Celebrimbor's primary weakness, however, is his curiosity. The most tragically adorable element of Celebrimbor's attitude at the start of this arc is his openness. He is completely unguarded and unsuspicious. He has promised to Galadriel not to treat with Halbrand, whatever that means exactly. But if Halbrand has news of the rings, Celebrimbor absolutely cannot resist talking to him. Sauron is a magnificent con artist throughout both the initial conversation in the rain and their later chat by the fireplace. It's hard to say how much Sauron actually knows before the conversation happens because he plays on Celebrimbor's openness, getting him to reveal everything he needs to know. Notice the directions in which he steers Celebrimbor, however. His first move is to say that Celebrimbor's state of ignorance is the oldest tale there is. We, the artists, do the work, and then they, the people in power, profit and neglect the artists. He has encouraged Celebrimbor to see himself shoulder to shoulder with Halbrand, and he has driven the first point of the wedge between Celebrimbor and Gilgalad. He then plays up to Celebrimbor's delightful and almost overwhelming joy in his own work, but he twists it, encouraging Celebrimbor not to think of the work itself and what it has accomplished, but to focus on himself and his own reputation and place in history. Sauron brings all these elements together in his final declaration that he is an emissary sent from the Valar to help Middle-earth in its time of need. This move brings together all of his previous ideas. He is lowly and patient in his arrival because he is only a servant and he has come to help. His coming is proof that Celebrimbor has been chosen, that his reputation has reached even Valinor itself. The idea of the Valar sending emissaries is entirely plausible, of course. The language that Sauron used echoes the language Tolkien uses to describe the wizards and their mission. This is absolutely something the Valar would do. Indeed, they're already doing it with the stranger. Having begun to push Celebrimbor in the direction he wants him to go, Sauron has now changed the nature of their relationship, establishing himself as someone Celebrimbor can trust completely. But the claim is still a strange one. And although the category of emissary sent from the Valar might be familiar to Tolkien readers, Celebrimbor has never heard of anything like this. 
Sauron moves to his culminating performance, providing Celebrimbor with the proof that he hasn't asked for, but that he clearly needs. Sauron doesn't just want Celebrimbor to trust him, he wants Celebrimbor to revere him. The revelation of Anatar is overlaid with a wealth of biblical images and concepts. The figure emerging from the flames unscathed is like the divine figure Nebuchadnezzar sees in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. Anatar stands surrounded by messianic glory, like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, his divine nature revealed in his radiant garments. Celebrimbor, overwhelmed, kneels before him and worships him, as most people in the Bible do when an angel appears before them, so great and so glorious is their presence. We even get an echo of one of Tolkien's stories, the crack of thunder and the stormy gust that blow the shutters open in the forge recall the storm of the Lords of the West that breaks in on the scholarly debates in the Notion Club papers. Sauron has made his play, and now that he has been accepted as a divine messenger, he is free to collaborate with Celebrimbor more fully and exert his power more openly. Sauron's claims to divinity play right into the con he was already running on Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor already felt that he was doing the work of the angels, saving the elves from the fading that was coming upon them. Sauron builds up his pride even more directly, announcing that Celebrimbor will always be remembered as the Lord of the Rings. The dramatic irony of this move is awesome. Nowhere is Sauron's disingenuousness more clear to us, the viewers. We know that it's Sauron himself who will be called that. But when the figure revealed in glory chooses that moment to reveal Celebrimbor's own future glory, it seems to have the authority of absolute truth. Having revealed his glorious nature, Sauron returns to the humble approach he started with when he showed up to Eregion. He names himself Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, but he doesn't assert lordship. He is merely a sharer of gifts, a partner and equal to the great Celebrimbor. Sauron doesn't claim to be the savior of the world. He is only the one who has come to assist and guide Middle-earth's true savior. Celebrimbor will be even greater than Feanor ever was. We can see the tragedy unfolding. Celebrimbor was achieving a greatness beyond Feanor's by giving up the rings for the sake of the greater good. But now he's been set on a path of self-glorification which, if it continues, will make him even more selfish and defiant than even Feanor was. So what do we know of Sauron's plan at this point? He wants to work with Celebrimbor to make rings of power for dwarves and men, though these rings he will corrupt directly. Presumably, the goal will be something like the enslavement of the will that he was bragging about in his original speech at the beginning of episode one. His specific emphasis on giving rings to men, which makes Celebrimbor uncomfortable, seems important. Sauron has already been proclaimed the true king of the Southlands in season one. Tolkien says that in the late Second Age, Sauron proclaims himself to be the king of all men. It looks like Sauron's plans are already tending in this direction. So what kind of power does Sauron actually have at this point? It's a little hard to tell, but the episode invites us to imagine that it's considerable. His dramatic revelation in the flames for Celebrimbor is probably an illusion. Notice that the forge goes out first, and then the light show begins. Also remember that in the Fellowship of the Ring, Galadriel associates Sauron's power with deceit. But at the same time, there is evidence of Sauron exerting some significant control of the world around him. Consider the storm clouds, which close over a Regian just in time to bring the rain that makes poor bedraggled Halbrand look most pitiable. The rain comes almost on cue, and the wind that blows the shutters open certainly does respond to Sauron's will. Remember also that Gilgalad has foreseen in his visions the black clouds closing over white towers. In addition, who killed the messenger bearing Gilgalad's warning to Celebrimbor? We only see the dead bodies being dragged off screen by chains. Were these messengers slain by Sauron or at his command? The cut from that scene straight back to Sauron and Eregion suggests it very strongly, and the chains may put us in mind of people being brought and bound in the darkness. How much does Sauron know? Does he know that the rings have worked and that the tree has been restored? In one sense, it hardly matters if he really knows that. He would tell Celebrimbor this anyway, in order to manipulate him. 
But if the black veins of corruption on the tree were the power of Sauron himself, then he might well know of their destruction and of the renewal of the tree, even from afar. Sauron's power is certainly growing very great. He has come a long way from that lonely puddle of goo languishing among the stalagmites. I would add that if he does restore his own being and power by consuming the life of other things, like Ungoliant does, then it would make even more sense for him to have corrupted the tree of Linden himself. Part of the reason he would be so powerful now is that he had drained the life of the tree almost dry, again, just like Ungoliant herself. Clearly, we are going to want to keep a close eye on what happens to poor Celebrimbor as his relationship with Sauron continues. We have this big moment, right? Where Halbrand finally disappears and Sauron rebrands himself as Anatar. The script walks us through this transition and between the words and delivery, I think it's really well handled to see that power of Sauron in manipulating his audience, bending their will to his. We're able to see how his will fits into their desires. It's woven together beautifully. Visually and audibly, however, there's also a lot of cues going on here to show us this transition from A to B and the manipulation of Celebrimbor. At the start of the scene, Sauron convinces Celebrimbor to let him inside. In the next shot, we see him relaxed in front of the fire, feet up, which is quite cocky and bold, really, and he's eating. Celebrimbor then brings him a drink. He's actually serving him already. When they discuss the rings, they're equal. They're sitting down next to each other, sharing information and company. They're comfortable. Celebrimbor is the first to rise, and we hear this choral music playing as he is reveling, basking in the glory of his success. And he's mostly centered in frame, giving him this moment in the spotlight. I really like this shot because it suggests that Celebrimbor is a good person aiming to do good, center in our, in our mind. But there Sauron sits, between him and the fire, an obvious threat. There's also a neat bit of camera work just after this in an exchange between Celebrimbor and Halbrand as he leads Celebrimbor into discovering that he is not Halbrand, but playing on his kind friendship, he convinces him that he is something else, Anatar, a messenger from the Valar. The shots are really standard conversation structure here, over the shoulder shots, back and forth, Sauron dead center, and Celebrimbor on the right side of the frame. The timing is very regular during their back and forth until this moment at 5056 when the cut is a hair too short and Celebrimbor is in a different position in the frame, shifting him to the left side. This is really jarring. It's meant to make us take notice in some way and it provides a shift in our own perception. Something has changed. Then they come together and Celebrimbor assures him to be at ease. By revealing himself falsely as vulnerable, Sauron has convinced Celebrimbor to come closer to him. He brings him in by playing the part and planting the seeds for the next step of his plan. The space is shared together until about 51 minutes in when he reveals, my name is not Halbrand. And here we begin the beautifully theatrical reveal, and it's as good as any 60s Broadway show. When he discusses Galadriel casting him out, boom, we have a thunder crash. He then starts to separate from Celebrimbor and sits down. He shows him as confident. He's able to relax, and he invites Celebrimbor closer. He's friendly, but very manipulative. Then there's a crash of thunder. The shutters open wide. These actions scream a how dare you doubt me, let me show you my power kind of vibe, and then he disappears. Then the wine shatters, the liquid spills out, and we've pointed that out before. It's an important visual cue of transition. It's like the visual grease for evil's wheels, akin to the goo or the spilled wine in the cart in episode one. The lights go out one at a time in quick succession, building tension with a spinning camera after this, placing us in a dizzying space. We're asking what's going on? We're as discombobulated as Celebrimbor is at this point. Our singular source of light then goes out. The camera spins and a disembodied voiceover begins. Our source of light becomes Anatar from the forge fire. It's just epically theatrical. We then have a holier than thou Anatar, although he hasn't said that name yet, um, presenting himself to Celebrimbor in a way that Celebrimbor could not deny this belief. He's, he's haloed in light. He's surrounded by a bright, warm, golden glow, and obviously from Valinor. The words he then speaks all paint Celebrimbor as the true savior. He is the artist who can save Middle-earth. Anatar is just the humble messenger. Celebrimbor bows to Anatar as he descends, so he's actually from on high and coming down to his level. He's clearly placing himself as holy and other visually and manipulatively, say, manipulatively saying, oh no, don't bow. 
I'm your partner, no more, no less. And that sets the most equals, which actually empowers Celebrimbor to rise and then ask his name. They're the same level in the frame, taking up equal space, but it is entirely of Anatar's exact design. And as he reveals himself as the Lord of Gifts, we hear a strong minor tone in the music and the camera is solely focused on Anatar, a signal that all is not as well as Celebrimbor believes. The shadow is one of the most pervasive images for evil, and Sauron's evil in particular, in Tolkien's stories. The shadow, or the shadow in the East, is sometimes used as an indirect way to refer to Sauron himself. He is the darkness that would spread and choke the light from the world. When the dawnless day comes to Gondor in the Lord of the Rings, the preternatural gloom that shrouds the earth is both a practical help to the creatures of darkness that march in Sauron's armies, and also a symbol of Sauron's own power reaching out like a black hand to enfold and crush the free peoples of Middle-earth. Season 2 of The Rings of Power has been billed by the Prime Video Marketing Division as the season in which darkness will rise. In Episode 2, we really see that being established across all of the plotlines. In Khazad Doom, a fist of darkness is closing around the mountain as literal darkness pervades their halls. In Rune, the Dark Wizard is doing ritual blood sacrifices in a dark temple of ancient evil. In Linden, even under the light of the newly restored tree, a shadow still lies on Galadriel's heart. In The Return of the King, when the shadow settles over Gondor, Gandalf and Pippin are looking out over the walls of Minas Tirith. It's the eve of the battle, and all preparations that can be made have been made. Gandalf uses a chess metaphor, saying that the board is set and the pieces are moving. The scene shows us Gandalf the White as he is revealed in the final stages of the story. He is Sauron's primary antagonist in the game of chess, standing next to Pippin, a pawn if ever there was one, as he reviews the layout of the chessboard, watching the black pieces make their big offensive move. In the Rings of Power, there is no Gandalf marshalling the white pieces as best he can in opposition to the shadow. At this stage of season two, Sauron is the only player at the table and every other character is just a piece on the board. We have seen him rise again from a puddle of goo, but he now seems suddenly to have taken control of almost all the narratives. How powerful exactly has Sauron grown? The delightful thing is that I rather suspect Sauron still to be largely winging it. We can see Sauron's moves in his conversation with Celebrimbor, and although he's subtle and effective, he is still clearly rolling the dice. That conversation might have gone very differently if Celebrimbor's mindset had been different. And yet the same sense of hopelessness that Galadriel describes, that sense of being caught in a labyrinth of evil from which there is no escape, is also one that we can feel. We have seen Sauron weak and almost helpless, and yet already, from one end of the continent to the other, Sauron seems to be in control. As Boromir said inside the gates of Moria, who will guide us in this deadly dark? Many people have commented on the fact that The Rings of Power is full of references back to the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films. Some people like these callbacks, but many people that I've heard from tend to be annoyed by them. I have heard a bunch of complaints from people whom I respect a great deal about these moments. The complaint that I hear most often is that these moments detract from The Rings of Power because they're just mindless evocations of the popular movies, apparently trying to buoy the show up by appealing to nostalgia for the old films. Now, any viewer is entitled to like or dislike whatever they choose, of course, and I have no interest in policing that. I do, however, heartily disagree with the idea that these references are mindless appeals to nostalgia. When I have noticed them and stopped to think about it, I always find that the connection is a very thoughtful one. Let me give an illustration. In episode two, Nori and Poppy take cover under a Harfoot tarp of concealment when the Easterling hunter approaches. The scene parallels quite closely the scene in the two towers when Frodo and Sam are hiding under the elf cloak when Easterling soldiers approach them. Now, what happens when we actually pursue this connection and think it through a bit? 
the reference invites us to juxtapose the two scenes. In The Two Towers, Frodo and Sam are at an important crossroads, a point where they are going to turn aside from the plain trail, the big old gate leading into Mordor, and go by a new and unexpected route that is going to lead them to new dangers and unexpected adventures. Uncoincidentally, Nori and Poppy also choose, immediately after this scene, a significant ch course change of their own, and by the end of the episode, it's already taken them into new dangers and unexpected adventures. Moreover, the fact that in both scenes, the soldier searching for them is a masked Easterling is another really important connection. In the Rings of Power, the Harfoots are traveling into the East, but they have little idea what they will find or what they're supposed to do about it. Neither the viewer nor the adventurers know much at all about what this journey has in store for them. But the connection to the two towers helps to remind viewers who know the Lord of the Rings films what is at stake in Rune. Someday, the armies of Rune are going to be flowing into Mordor to strengthen Sauron's armies, as they were in the Two Towers. Maybe somebody should, you know, try to do something about that. There are other points I could make about this connection and many other connections I could discuss, but I just wanted to make this general point. When you notice a callback to the older films, try not to be automatically dismissive, but first stop and think through how the illusion works. You may certainly dislike them if you choose, but before you roll your eyes and indulge a knee-jerk reaction, pause for a bit and give it some more consideration. The opening shot of Episode 2 shows us a top-down view into the bubbling caldera of Mount Doom. If this looks vaguely familiar to you, it should! We saw this shot for about two total frames or so in The Stranger's Dream in Episode 1. Everything else in that dream related to things of immediate importance. The Dark Wizard, Nori and Poppy being swept away by the wind, and the staff that he is supposed to find or make. But one thing in the dream seemed rather odd, and that was the brief flash of this lava shot, which looked at the time just like some red pulsating organ or something. At first glance, I thought it was some monstrous heart pulsing sluggishly. So why does the stranger dream of Mount Doom? I rather suspect that what we are looking down on is the cracks of doom seen from above. If so, then this would be the Samoth Naur, the heart of Sauron's power and the future forging place of the One Ring. That would mean that this lava dream would be the first indirect warning or presentiment that anyone in the show has had about the forging of the One and the fulfillment of Sauron's stratagems. In Rune, the Bad Blue Wizard is sitting in what looks like an ancient temple, and that temple is called the Fortress of Terror. Both the building and its name make a lot of sense if we keep in mind what Tolkien has told us about the history of the far east of Middle-earth. When men first awoke back in the First Age, Morgoth, Sauron's old boss, came among them and tempted early humans, befriending them and seeking to get them to worship him instead of Iluvatar, the monotheistic god of Tolkien's world. The story, as Tolkien retells it, is closely parallel to the story of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis. The end result is that the vast majority of the ancestors of humankind end up worshipping the Lord of Darkness in temples out in the Far East. Based on other precedents in Tolkien's stories, I would expect that this worship included things like blood rituals and human sacrifice. It therefore makes perfect sense that there would be thousand-year-old stone temples out in the Far East and that they would be associated with evil blood magic rituals. It also makes sense that if you were a wizard with loose morals, a desire for power, and some time on your hands, you might head off into the east, park yourself on a throne in one of those scary ancient temples, and set about exploiting the cultural memory of the locals in order to make them think that you were the personal representative of the terrifying dark blood god of their ancient mythology. This is a playbook that we actually see Sauron running multiple times in the Third Age of Middle-earth, and the Dark Wizard appears to have it in full gear already. Right before Celebrimbor makes the fatal mistake of welcoming Sauron, 
faithless and accursed, into his establishment, we see Celebrimbor in what I assume will be his final moment of innocent artistry. He has made Ithildim, the substance used for writing on walls in letters that reflect only the light of the moon and stars. Ithildim is famous for being the substance with which Celebrimbor draws the image and message on the west gate of Moria, the doors which Gandalf will someday not know how to open. The West Gate is going to be a collaboration between Celebrimbor and the dwarf Narvi, who seems already to have plenty of work on his hands over in Khazad Dûm. The clock is now officially ticking on Celebrimbor's career, so the West Gate of Moria is almost certainly going to be made sometime this season. The collaboration which the doors represent has been in the minds of many Tolkien readers a symbol of the happier days of the past, when there was friendship between the dwarves and the elves. There may not be much time left for Celebrimbor and Narvi to establish a firm friendship, but I am looking forward to at least one good scene together. I have to think that the password for the gates will end up having some reference to the relationship between Durin and Elrond. In any case, the importance of the Athildine scene, apart from what it points to later in the story, is that it shows us something of Celebrimbor's heart as a craftsman. He shows it to Myrdania, his associate, and he takes real pleasure in her surprise and wonder. He does not seem arrogant, nor is he seeking praise for himself. He is simply taking delight in the beauty of what he has made. There's a kind of humility, even a kind of innocence, in his pleasure in the work. It is this innocence that we see Sauron immediately moving to corrupt and destroy in Celebrimbor when he gains entrance at Eregion. So I had been thinking of starting this segment with me sitting on a rock by a tide pool, shaving off my beard, preferably with a crustacean of some sort. I thought that'd be pretty funny, but in the end I just wasn't really committed enough to the concept. It was too hard to get all that water in here. Anyway, you've probably seen people losing their minds over Círdan shaving off his beard. Círdan the Shipwright, famously, is the only recorded bearded elf. Tolkien says in more than one place that elves don't grow beards, and then there, waiting for the departing heroes at the Grey Havens at the end of The Lord of the Rings, is the conspicuously bearded Círdan. Círdan is probably the oldest elf we ever meet. In some writings, Tolkien describes Círdan as one of the first generation of elves ever to walk the earth. His beard seems like some sort of nod to his extreme antiquity, extreme even on the elvish timescale. His unexpected shave, therefore, would seem to point to a rejuvenation after he puts on Narya. New ring, new me, and all that. His shaving might seem a little silly, and I did really like his beard in episode one, but he does look a lot younger after the shave. I don't hate the concept. Here's a funny side effect of this particular choice, though. It almost felt to me like a metatextual joke at the expense of fan response. One group of fans would go berserk if Círdan were not depicted with a beard. A different group of fans would spend the whole show annoyed at that one elf who had a beard because it just doesn't feel like Tolkien with a short-haired bearded elf on the screen. So they did both. Now everybody's happy, right? I have been really interested in the sand and vibration patterns of the title sequence since the first season, and this season they are much more complicated. Once more, the use of sound vibrations to form orderly pictures from loose sand evokes the music of the Ainur, and this concept is visually echoed by the magic of the stranger. This season, the sequence begins with lava flowing from Mount Doom, establishing the color red within the sandscape for the first time. The spreading red swirls of lava suggest the spreading evil influence of Sauron, originating at the future center of his power, Mount Doom, and even swirling about to hint at the forging of one of the rings. The shot then shows all of the rings of power, three, seven, and nine, and then we see the rings connected into a great tree like the Tree of Linden, hinting at how the elves and their tree are bound now to the rings of power. We then get a dwarven sequence, with the crown of Durin with seven stars above it, looking just like it does on the gates of Moria, and the archway of the west gate itself, and then, creepily, the head of the Balrog coming straight towards you. I love that sequence. The detailed Numenorean sun that we see next turns to red around its perimeter, 
reddening as if it were running with blood, reddening like the setting sun in decline. Red, after all, is the color of Numenor's future. When the evil theme breaks in, instead of the asymmetrical black serpent figure of season one, we break the two-dimensional plane entirely, seeing the sand tossed in the air in a swirl disturbingly like the whirlwind conjured by our friend the Blue Wizard. We get several ominous and swiftly shifting images in the sand, in which the shape of the bad Blue Wizard's staff and Sauron's bladed crown feature prominently at beginning and end. The entire sequence recalls not just the music of the Ainur from the Ainu Indale, but the vision after the music, in which Iluvatar shows the Valar in visible form the story that their music wrought. But the vision is taken away before the Valar can perceive the whole or understand all of what they were shown. The sequence of images in the title sequence puts me in mind of that. It's a series of images literally created by sound and providing a glimpse into the story of what is to come in the show. Let me clarify something really quickly to make sure no one misunderstands. Lots of people have been convinced from the beginning that the stranger was Gandalf, and certainly those people will be jumping up and down about the Harfoot's use of the word Gand for stick or staff. Gandalf's name, of course, comes from Old Norse, and it means wand elf, or less literally, that magic dude who walks around carrying a stick. The reference to the wizard's missing Gand sounds like an indication that staff and name are linked together, and that when he obtains the staff that fits him, the name that fits him will also be revealed. I think this is all perfectly plausible, and it seems very likely. I just want to remind people of what I've been saying about this since halfway through season one. I have been saying all along that the stranger is a blue wizard, and that through his story, we are going to see a development of the almost completely unwritten story of the Blue Wizards. Season 2 has confirmed that this is true, and it will remain true even if his name is revealed to be Gandalf. The story of the Stranger and the Dark Wizard is the story of the Blue Wizards. It is a combination and expansion of almost everything that Tolkien wrote about the Blues, which is very little indeed. My advice is that you don't get so caught up in the Gandalf hype that you overlook what we're seeing, and that is the only screen adaptation of the story of the Blue Wizards that you might ever get to see. As you can tell from what I said earlier in this episode, I'm not ignoring the potential identification with Gandalf. I still don't love it as an adaptation choice, though I admit that there could be some good payoffs. It will allow them to do the Círdan Gandalf ring toss, for one thing, and if I turn out to be right about the Witch King, then the opposition of the Stranger and the Dark Wizard will lay some pretty cool groundwork. But I still don't love it. However, I repeat again, if he's Gandalf, he is unofficially Gandalf the Blue, and I'm fine with that. Season 2 is giving me exactly the Blue Wizard story I was hoping for. They are welcome to call him whatever they want. Even Steve, I won't complain. Well, that's us done for episode two. What an adventure thus far. There are a lot of moving pieces, but the main storylines are starting to come into focus. There's still so much to come. And remember, we're going through three episodes in the time that it takes to create one normally. So we're really looking forward to the fun that we can have with a bit more time to breathe. So if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe and check out Rings and Realms on Kickstarter to join in on the journey with us. We can't wait to see you again really soon as we dive into episode three.